research on insults in the early modern period has been based so far largely on police records and judicial records. And these sources are extremely valuable. They give us access to voices of social groups which are not heard otherwise. However, as David Garriott pointed out, the pioneering study of insults in 18th century Paris, such sources have their limitations. They only record those cases which came to the attention of the authorities. And often, information regarding context and the relationship between those involved is missing. What I'd like to do today is to highlight that other sources for the history of insults are available. And in this paper, I'm going to be focusing on one of the longest and most detailed discussions of insults written during the early modern period. And this is a book, this is a book written by the Bolognese professor, Camillo Baldi, entitled Delle Considerazione e dubitazione sopra la materia delle mentite e offese di parole, libre duba, which translates as reflections and doubts on the subject of falsehoods and verbal insults in two volumes, and it's published in Venice in 1634. For reasons which I'll explain later, this book has been neglected almost entirely by scholars, despite its richness as a source. But before looking at the book, I'd like to set it in context of recent research on the nature of insults, of the high levels of violence in early modern Italy, and of the laws of honour which responded to, and perhaps encouraged, this violence. During the last 30 years, there has been growing research on insults, <coughs> and this research has involved <coughs> scholars from a range of disciplines. <coughs> flavour of this. For example, we have um, this study here by Alan Reed, uh, a jewel of honour screen from observable social capital. They are economists. So economists are interested in insults. We have another work, uh, Beatty and Pence. Their background, they are communication scholars. And also, down here, we've got Bax and Kada and Sorlin. These are experts in linguistics. So a variety of disciplines are interested in the topic of violence. And this is just a very small sample to give you some indication of the variety of approaches. Insults have also been of interest to historians, working on Europe and the rest of the world. And traditionally it was argued that forms of insult in Europe are essentially static or change very slowly, that they were based on taboos which were shared by different societies at different times. Namely, bodily excretion and sexual activity. However, in his study of insults in 15th century Bologna, Trevor Dean suggests that the most powerful of insults can in fact be culturally specific. Dean accepts that the general pattern of insult in Bologna conforms to already established forms, which have been noted by research on 13th century Italy, 16th century York, or 18th century Paris. In these places, as in Bologna, there was a basic division between insults directed at women and those directed at men. Women were insulted through their sexuality or their sexual decency. Men through their roles as carriers of public trust, or through their honesty, courage, and worth. According to Dean, however, the majority of insults were more complex than this. They were more varied in structure than a simple exchange of abuse. And in his study of Roman insults in the 16th and 17th centuries, Peter Burke has shown how the sequence of elements in insults often started with a challenge, progressed through a statement of triumph, and ended in a threat. In another study of Roman insults in the 16th century, Thomas Cohn argues that, this is a quote, so pervasive, so persuasive, so consistent with the language and gestures of Italian honour culture, that one can, for the sake of argument, venture the risky proposition that acts of outrage 
exemplify what Cohen calls a lay liturgy of a flock. There is this established framework, process of insight. Dean emphasizes that men and women, in uttering insults, adopt different modes of defamation. <coughs> men took the active part, claiming sexual knowledge of their victims, or directly threatening them with physical expulsion. Women make only indirect threats. Women had only a partial, incomplete control of the lexicon of abuse, according to Dean. He also found evidence which shares characteristics with forms of mock impoliteness, such as the modern game of ritual insult practiced by black youth gangs in the United States, which was studied by William Laboff in a famous essay um, on linguistic analysis. The game which Laboff studies is that of exchanging insults without actually da damaging the honor or reputation of the victim. This is ritual insult, not real insult. In Labov's interpretation, <coughs> rituality is preserved by directing the insult against the victim's mother or other close relative. For example, this is to take a mild example, this is a quote, your mother's so black, she sweat chocolate which is clearly impossible. So because it's impossible, it's not a real insult. It doesn't damage anybody's reputation. And Labov argues for the existence of shared knowledge between the speaker and the addressee. A shared knowledge that these far-fetched insults are impossible or untrue. And this prevents them from being perceived as actual insults. The theory of shared knowledge rests on the basic distinction of discourse analysis between what is said and the actions being performed with words. Apart from gender, Dean also notes the role of class in insults. He argues that men's insults cross hierarchical lines in two ways. First, because they make insults against men in positions of authority or in government office. Secondly, men's insults cross status lines more clearly than women's, and because of this, they became more complex and more delayed. Dean's evidence suggests that insults in which speaker and victim were of similar status tended to be simpler, and insults in which the victim was of higher social status tended to be more complex. In order to damage the face and reputation of higher status victims, lower class speakers had both to multiply their lines of attack and to repeat the elements of defilement. And Dean suggests that Irving Goffsman's comment on aggressive face damaging encounters would seem to apply here. He likens them to contests in an arena in which the aim is to score as many points against the adversary as possible. The issue of insults is particularly important in the history of early modern Italy, as levels of violence were significantly higher in the Italian states than in the rest of Europe during this period. In a, probably come across this before, but in his study of long-term trends in violent crime, Manuel Eisner has calculated that the homicide rate in England dropped from 7 to 6 per 100,000 of the population in the first half of the 17th century, from 7 to 6. Whilst in Germany in the same period, it was stable at 11 homicides per 100,000. Meanwhile, in the Italian states, the rate did fall, but from 47 to 32 in the same period. As Stuart Carroll has argued, Italian homicide rates did not fall <coughs> nearly as quickly as they did in the north of Europe. In many regions of Italy, notably the south and on the islands, the rates remained stable until the unification of Italy in the 19th century. And there is a link, we may talk about some questions later, there may be a link between the nature of the state and the legitimacy of the state and the homicide, but we can talk about that later. 
However, there are problems with this argument. Gerd Schwerhoff has questioned whether the long-term decline of violence from the 14th to the middle of the 20th century was real. He notes the highly heterogeneous nature of Iceland's sources and points out that the judicial normative basis in space and time is extremely variable. Schwerhoff also argues that the statistical data is undermined by the many problems with measuring the basic total figure of the total population. However, the number of relevant analyses of the early modern period is still limited. There is no comparable data for France and no accountable analyses of serial sources covering a long period for the German-speaking ter territory. So we've got a problem with our sources. However, Schwerhoff accepts that the level of violence did decrease from the 16th to the 18th century, but he rejects the idea of a long-term process. And here's a quote from him. All that can be proven, somewhat empirically, is merely the fact that there has been a change in the levels of violence within a period of time that can be limited to 200 or 300 years. This does not apply to all parts of Europe, though, not, for example, to the Mediterranean area, where a distinct culture of violence prevailed for a longer period of time. Recent research has moved away from the traditional emphasis on homicide rates. Instead, it's focusing on the widespread prevalence of faction and feuding in the towns and cities of the Italian states in the early modern period. There are not numerous sources which suggest that these forms of violence in the Italian states were frequent and that they were shocking to contemporaries. For example, quote, whilst travelling in Italy in 1596 and 1597, the English courtier Sir Robert Dallington observed two ways in which quarrels were settled. For minor offences, this is a quote from him, the party wrong, if not in some high degree, will challenge the other to fight. If they be both provided, it is presently undertaken. Otherwise, it is deferred to the next day or some such short date. The place appointed is commonly in the city and in the chiefest street. Here they encounter with a good skull and with their hats a large male to their knee and to their apparel, besides their gold. So that if they had a supersedious for their face and would do as the boys do in England, by striking the shins, or as the scholars, the students of Padua, who have plates for this purpose, no doubt the Damitas and Cuneus might, might thus make a tale of the fray. I saw two gallants in Pisa, the fight thus completely provided, were after a very furious encounter, and the most merciless shredding and slashing of their apparel, and the most desperate resolution to cut one another out of his clothes, that they were, to the saving of many a stitch, part of and by mediation of much ado made friends. So that's for minor quarrels. But Dallington also witnessed the widespread practice in the Italian states of the vendetta, for which, the injured party will wait an opportunity seven years, but he will take you at the advantage, or else do it by some others, whom he will hire for the purpose. In this sort were two slain in Pisa while he was there, the one a merchant, the other a knight of the order of Santa Stefan. The one coming from his hall, the other going thither. Two also in Siena in seven days. But my coming hither to Venice, this is general through all Italy, there were on Shrove Sunday at night 17 slain and very many wounded. Besides that there, if they reported, there was almost every night one slain all that carnival time. So here we've got qualitative <coughs> data, not quantitative, and I said there were problems with the quantitative data, but this is from contemporary, and he is shocked at what he was seeing in Italy. As Colin Rose has been showing, Bologna, the recent PhD. Um, Bologna was a particular focus for faction and feuding, and we need to bear this in mind when we consider the writing on insults by the Bolognese professor Camillo Baldi. Why was the situation in Bologna so bad? It's been suggested by Rose and by Carroll that this had much to do with the conquest of Bologna by the Pope, Julius II, in 1506. 
rule by priest was widely resented, and the local aristocracy considered themselves to be defenders of civic liberty. The emasculation of the nobility was emblematic of a tyrannia ecclesiastica, church tyranny. Despite the outlawing of the practice in 1567, every noble continued to employ teams of bravi, heavies, the painting I showed at the beginning by Titian, that's of one of these bravi, um, folks, the henchmen. Every noble family in Bologna continued to have employ these teams of bravi. And during the 17th century, there was a vicious cycle of vendettas which led to a hundred noble victims being killed or wounded. And violence spread from the city of Bologna into the countryside, and it involved all social classes. And Rose estimates a suicide, sorry, a homicide rate for this region, rising from 15 per 100,000 in 1620 to 61 in 1660. So triple <coughs> murder rate. Dueling was an important part of this culture. However, the evidence concerning dueling is surprisingly thin. And the absence of evidence for actual duels has led some scholars to doubt their existence at all. However, according to Carroll, the failure to locate the practice is a failure of interpretation. Italians, like their French counterparts, rarely use the term duel because dueling was illegal. It was dangerous to mention it, and duels were fought secretly. In the judicial archives, it's very difficult to distinguish the duel from the brawl, an Italian word for brawl, the risa, but often in practice it's the same thing. And the task is made more difficult by the invention of new practices which permitted the defense of honor without falling foul of the law. Italians referred to these encounters not as duels, but as questione or chistione, questions. So that's the word they would use for what we would consider as a duel. And the concept of a legitimate questione was reinforced by a papal bull of 1582, in which it distinguished between a duel and the risa de improviso. So the difference between basically malice of forethought, a planned duel, an organised duel, and something, a brawl which happens spontaneously. There's some difference between them. The condemnation of duelling and vengeance in the 25th session of the Council of Trent in 1563, and the outlawing of duel, honour duels by Pope Clement VII in 1592, encouraged the development of what's called the scienza cavalleresca, the knightly knowledge, the laws of honour, which governed gentlemen of conduct. And these are first produced in the 1550s and a lively debate on their nature in print and in public disputations continues until the 18th century. Recently, Italian scholars have taken a positive view of the scienza cavalleresca, emphasizing its practical applications, its disciplinary role in controlling the nobility, and the social function of its rituals of peacemaking. The professors of the Scienza argued that it gave individuals the tools to settle their disputes peacefully and without recourse to the law, the so-called pace privata, the private peace, and that the resort to arms was no barrier to an eventual reconciliation. Crucial to this was the difference between the illegal duel, arranged, preordained, for him and the spontaneous quest the owner. To give you an idea of how lively this debate is, and I'll just whiz through these, um, some key titles in this genre, the Scienza Cavalleresca, to give you an idea of how popular um, the genre was. So we've got the first one starting in 1476, translated to Latin, then translated into Italian. So we go, I'll take these from uh, our chronological order just to give you um, some idea of the key titles. And you notice we are getting here in this period references to jewels. But when you get further on, they disappear. That's fine. Um, 
Yeah. So this one, for example, there's no reference to jewels. It's talking about um, organised pieces and private enemies uh, arguments. So because it's illegal at this point, they're not using the word of more than 15 years. Stop that. And these texts <laughs> focus largely on the practical aspects of the jewel or question, <laughs> as well as on the peacemaking process. That's their main focus. They usually devote, devote only a few pages to the issue of mentite, falsehoods which are made knowingly and to injure the reputations of others. It's only with the works of Camillo Balbo, these two of you, that entire books focus on the issue of Mentita and the subjects of falsehoods and insults. So he really specialises in this particular topic. So, who was Balbo? Who is our author? He's born in Bologna in 1550. He dies there in 1637. From 1576 until his death, 61 years later, he taught at the University of Bologna, and he held chairs in philosophy, logic, and the human, humanarum literarum. He also served as pro-chancellor of the university and vicar of the archdeacon. His writings include studies of Aristotle's ethics and politics, graphology, the relationship between the body and the soul, and alchemy. Towards the end of his life, Baldi writes two works on falsehoods and verbal insults. The first one, which was published in Bologna in 1623, De Mentite e Offese di Corona. So that's the first text that he produces. And then later, this is the text I'm going to focus on. The Delle Consideratione e Dubitazione, published in Venice in 1634. Both of these books are wrong. The 1623 study has 350 pages, and the 1634 study, which is what we're going to look at today, 557. So very long. They are both dedicated to members of the Bolognese elite. And I think this is how they need to be interpreted. Because if I explain this particular violent situation in Bologna, there is a need to understand what is causing the violence and what's supposed to control it. So both of them are dedicated to members of the elite <coughs> in Bologna. The 1623 text, the first one, is, is mentioned occasionally in discussions, discussions of the Scienza Cavalleresca. For example, the best introduction is this recent article by Stuart Carroll, published in Preston Pleasant last year. He talks about the first one, and Stuart's not made typical. Um, most people will talk about the first one, hardly anybody talks about the second one. And I think, why is this? They assume that the second book is just the second edition of the first one, and it's not, it's a completely different book. People can realise it. The second book, which we're going to be looking at, offers detailed arguments, often using stories set across the Italian peninsula. So I'm going to be showing you some of the chapter headings, and there are about 100 of them. But for each of these chapters, they're about six or seven pages long. And for each of the chapters, there is a story to give um, a situation in which this particular argument arises. And these stories are set across the towns, the cities, also the countryside of Italy. It's not just the Bologna setting, it's across Italy. And apart from its value to people interested in violence or incidents, it's a very rich source for anybody who's interested in Italian social history of this period. What has happened in these places. So, and it's downloadable for free off Google Books. So, which is very nice. Um, it's a fabulous source. I'm trying to say cheerleading for Baldi as a source, or just get people reading. <laughs> um, in order to reveal Baldi's approach and the richness of this longest of early modern commentaries and insults, I'd like to share with you what he calls the dubi, the arguments of this 1634 text. As we consider these, 
this, this would be the, sort of the, the final section of the, of the paper. As we consider these, I'd like you to keep some questions in mind as we go through. What subjects does Baldi highlight? That's the first one. What subjects does he highlight? Are there any patterns in the topics which he discusses? Are some topics repeated? And if so, why? How do these works fit into the tradition of the Scienza Cavalleresca? Which I've just been talking about. How can you see it fitting into that tradition? And finally, how might we apply recent methodologies in the study of insults? For example, for example, gender, class, linguistic analysis, which have been applied to these other types of evidence, the judicial and police records. Can we look at gender, class, and linguistic analysis and use these methodologies for this text? So as we go through, try and keep these things in mind. So what does he talk about? So here we go. This is what he talks about. Whether one who dares not give vent to his rancor is dishonored, and whether he must always do this. Whether the defamed can defame others. Whether the gentleman can retract what he has said. Whether facts always remove spoken insults. Whether the falsehood joined with rudeness is appropriate for a knight. A falsehood together with a blow is not laudable. Whether one has to respond to a fraudulent falsehood. Whether the gentleman has to respond to accusations made behind his back. Why we wish to know whether others speak badly of us, and why we hate us, we've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> so we might want to read that one to start. Why we hate the speaker. Why it is seen to be shameful to, to suffer damaging words, and whether it is worse to do or to suffer injury. That man is obliged to defend God's things, the fatherland, and his prince. Whether the gentleman should pursue the vendetta. Whether it is wrong and blameworthy to pursue a vendetta whilst negotiating <laughs> peace. Whether it is the act of a knight to deny the offence and to hide bad feelings towards the offender. <coughs> Whether contempt alone, or the opinion of contempt, makes a civil man, or much of it, eh, angry. Whether there is a difference between the gentleman, the good citizen, and the good Christian. Whether the gentleman must take account of what people say. Whether it is enough for the gentleman to satisfy his conscience. Whether it is honourable to avenge oneself against an enemy in every way that one can. Whether a blow with a club is blamed. <laughs> Whether it is allowed for a gentleman to sell peace and for another to buy. Whether it is better to be or to seem good. <laughs> Hypocrisy is not here. Whether a poor artisan must hold a gentleman to account if he catches it with his work. Whether a noble can reject making peace with an inferior. Why men are hard at making peace and have little obligation to those who make peace. Whether the falsehood given in the presence of the prince or in the house of others also offends that. There is no action more fitting for a gentleman than to negotiate and conclude peace. How to negotiate and conclude peace is what the mediators need to know. Should mediators start the negotiations with the offender or with the offender? Whether the offender should always ask for peace and whether he should do it. Is it praiseworthy to ask for satisfaction? And when and how to do this? Whether the offender should try to reveal the faults of the offender in the act of peace. Whether asking peace and friendship is satisfaction. Whether the injured party can regain the honour thought to be lost through the injury. Whether the honoured knight can without shame refuse to fight his equal. Whether the gentleman must all, always avenge hidden injuries, whether words or deeds. Whether the person injured secretly can avenge himself honourably. Whether the offender, having negotiated in a friendly way with the offender, can avenge himself. Finally, it's an ugly thing to offend others having given them his work. We're only halfway. <laughs> There's more. <coughs> 
So, book two. And in the introduction to book two, he gives the aims. He's going to give advice about hidden sources, based, he says, on true cases, the names having been hidden to protect from these. So, what do these cases talk about? One can live without honour in the city. Being despised, vilified, and hated is a very great evil to civil men. That in different people there is diverse virtue and goodness, but not everyone is on the equal. The reasons why men are honored, and how many and which are the grades of honor, and then he goes through the social ranks from top to bottom. Whether women, children, and servants have honor, and whether they can give it or receive it. On insults and how others can lose your honor, what it means to lack honor, and in how many ways that happens. <coughs> whether one who has once lost their honor is dishonored, and whether it is possible to become honored as before. Whether one who is offended accidentally must pursue vendetta and rancor against <coughs> the offender. The offender. Whether for the offense with fraud it is sufficient to say, I was wrong to save one's honour. Whether the gentleman is entitled to quarrel with his wife's mother, which offence this might be, and what his grudge might be. Whether hidden offences and those done in secret merit a grudge, and what might be the way to avenge them. Whether one can make peace before everyone and in every place and time without prejudice to those who make it. Whether one should have a grudge against someone who passes us in the street without greeting us. <laughs> yeah. Next thing you'll know, you're in a vendetta. <laughs> Whether it is laudable to call others for questioning that motive and for fault. <laughs> Whether a gentleman can sell peace without blame. Whether in a public fight in questioning, he who knows his satisfaction for himself must seek more. Whether it is good to put one's honor in the hands of others and through them make peace, and whether one must preserve such a peace. Whether it is best to seek the satisfaction owed to one or to receive it from the event of old peril. <coughs> what grudge can the civil man honorably have against the religious and this is the clergy? Because what happens if you're offended by a member of the clergy? Whether it is permitted to offend one's enemy whilst negotiating peace with them. Whether a knight despised by his prince should hold a grudge for this affair. Whether a man can make a reviled man honour. Whether a poor and ignoble man can be refused negotiation by him. A notary from an honest family is clogged. He feels that he cannot make an honourable peace unless he remembers his own. Whether the husband, who is an honoured knight, can be justly angry with his wife's lover. Whether testifying against <coughs> someone in a criminal case is a vile act. How important is the loss of one's work, and how can one, how can one address this loss? How a craftsman, architect, can hold a grudge when he feels offended by some religious? Whether he who offends someone in our company, in our house, or who seeks our help, offends us? <coughs> Whether force and violence are ways to find the truth and the motive? Whether the, the desire to avenge oneself is lawful? What is our obligation to those who come to us for help and are with us when others offend them and our words do not stop them? Whether we should favour or not someone in our company who assaults another? Whether after long and valiant service a soldier can be rejected for deeds done before he was a soldier? Whether an honoured knight should be charged with a grave failure of behaving differently in private and in public? How would one may be able to negotiate peace when the interested parties have not been for a long time? Whether the peace made by someone on their deathbed should be observed? Whether honour is born in us, or, or rather it is necessary to acquire it? Whether every offence is capable of satisfaction of peace in hand? Whether it is permitted to draw one's arms against the evil of those who the other? Whether one who has struck another in any way he wishes can say what he wants to the how to treat and address fights and conflicts between close relatives. Whether a man from a good family who is otherwise regarded well does a vile deed of marrying a prostitute. Whether an honored man must forgive the offense and always pardon someone who asks forgiveness and confesses his error in his sin. 
and that's a particularly awful case, which I might come back to in question. Um, but a leading lord does not have to seek satisfaction from someone who is not even his inferior. Outline of some opinions which may be used in making private pieces, whether words can satisfy offences of deeds, and what may be the value of the word in making pieces. Consideration of the motives which occurred in Paris de Boutio induced men to make battalion. Consideration of some words and deeds to be used in making pieces, or almost there. On the words which are often joined with deeds according to the writers of the dual mentions, whose turn it is to us, peace and to give conditions. Whether we are obliged to hold grudge against those who are found by men, administrators, servants, and those who live with us. Whether in the most serious offences, the offenders kiss the offenders. On bad reports, witness statements, and how one must do it. Conclusion. So, as you can see, this is the, this is a very long book, looking at a variety of different cases. But as I said, when I was introducing it. Can we see some patterns? Are some topics more popular than others? Are some things recurring? Did you spot anything which you were particularly obsessed with? Infidelity. What sort of things does you say about women or wives? It's almost nothing down on women and their own. Mm. It's all about the men and their own yeah. and how one should how one man should treat another man yeah. who's obviously having relations with his wife or vice versa. Um, and then and the different social classes that can be involved in that particular act Good. To be like more for it's the hierarchy. hierarchy. Mm -hmm. He's very big on hierarchy. It comes up again and again. What happens if your prince, if your prince insults you? Is your social social superior? Do you have a grudge against him? You're supposed to go and challenge him or something? Because that screws up the whole hierarchy. Also, if you think of hierarchy, um, there's the question of what happens if you're challenged by an equal? Are you bound to respond? Also, what happens if you're challenged, insulted by an inferior? Because the common thought was, if some <coughs> peasant insults a knight, there is no loss of honour, because there is no equivalence of, of, of honour. So therefore, you don't need to respond, it's just a peasant. You know, I think that damaged it in a way, it's a peasant. But that's something which we discussed. Coming back to the women question, there is a chapter in which he says, do women have honour? Do children have honour? Do servants have honour? <coughs> so, as, as, as you noted, most of the focus is on men. But he does devote this chapter, do women have honour? When I gave this um, at another seminar, um, David Garrard, who works on the in France, he, he picked up on that one. Because he said, in France, that would just never come up. There was just no recognition of women they didn't even talk about it. And that's what he thought was interesting. They didn't even consider it. The question of the two women have gone out. But he does. He does not. Sorry. But do do attendants consider that women and children have been? Or is it partly who is simply Because you're it's like you're the property of your husband or yeah. what it reflects on the family honor. That's how it's usually seen. Mm. It's not honor in themselves, mm. it's because of the family or <coughs> the husband. Insulted a wife or a child, they insult, uh, the, the insult, the insult to the, the husband the or the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very similar to right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not it's the damage the, that it does yeah. to the woman. Yes. And also, I, mean, I mentioned this of these cases. If somebody has offended you grievous, grievously, and asks for forgiveness, do you have to forgive them? Mm -hmm. No, I don't pick that one out, so I'll come back to it. That case is particularly horrific. Um, the story is told of a knight and his wife travelling on the countryside of the Friuli, which is the area northeast of Venice. And they meet this gang of young men. The knight, the husband, is not unconscious. The wife is abducted, she's kidnapped, she's kept for two or three days, and she's raped. Then she is released, she returns to her husband, and the man who led the gang, who kidnapped her, he goes to the husband, 
and ask forgiveness. Not of the woman, of the husband. So, what do you do in that situation? And I think in that case, it's the right way. You don't have to forgive somebody sort of that. But that's one of the things, this idea of whose honour is involved. Um, but other things that we can kind of talk about different methodologies, we talked a bit about gender, we talked a bit about class. But could we see some linguistic, some of the issues that the linguistic experts have raised? For example, example sort of false insult. Does that come up here, did you say? Ideas of which of insults which are not actually insults. That, it's that idea that you could be insulted, but if the insult has no foundation in yeah. reality, then yeah. it's not like an insult. So you can't, if you're... Yeah, it's yeah. 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 so, okay, people work on it in you know, 20th century Chicago, but you know, he's in 17th century Bologna, and he talks about these insults for fun, fake insults. So they're already aware of the issue. And <coughs> what do you do? Is it a real insult? Is there any damage being done? So they are considering it. So we can use that methodology, take it from the linguistic people, and apply it to sources such as that. So that's another use of the source. In, in, in the lack of words, if someone doesn't uh, say hello to you in household street, yeah. is that therefore the consultant is not Yeah, because you haven't been recognised. You know, your status has not been recognised. And also, I, mean, I gave you those examples of you know, Downton walking around Pisa. Um, most of my records are judicial records based in Pisa, students and graduate professors. And that is one of the most common reasons for a fight, is what happens in the street. Um, either they don't recognise you, or the issue of precedence. So, you know, you have to go off the pavement or whatever. <coughs> that will lead to fisticuffs or worse. And that happens all the time. Or the other thing is carriages. Who gives way? Because these streets are quite narrow. You've got two carriages. <coughs> really. Who's got right and why? So these things <coughs> are quite violent. And not just Pisa. Um, there's been a recent study of Rome on carriages in Rome provoking violence. So it was the traffic in Rome in the 17th century was horrendous. Um, and there was violence because of it. So, <coughs> Are we moving into questions? Yes. Oh. <laughs> it's more than four one. I won't feel insulted. Well, actually, everybody I've given this paper to has been so polite, <laughs> which means I've failed completely to be insulted. So feel free to have a go. It's certainly not too broad a question. You mentioned uh, pre unified. Yes. And sort of the relationship between, I guess, the state and yeah. the environment. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That's a good question. <coughs> um, as I said, there are problems <coughs> with the thesis that there is this decline, but you can look at various sources and see that there are high levels of violence. So let's accept that there are high levels of violence in the Italian states, particularly in the south and the islands. What's going on? The argument to Stuart Carroll's argument is to do with civil society and the legitimacy of the state. Whether states are recognised as legitimate authorities and the officers of the state are recognised as legitimate authorities. And this is a problem in these states until the sort of mental unification of Italy. When, if you look at the data, there does seem to be a change. Because you have got I mean, the Italian state, it's not great today, but it's better than. And Carroll argues that this is the reason that there are high levels of violence, because if the state is the function to settle these disputes, you have to have other forms. This is where you get the private peace and that. It fills that back. That's his argument. Isn't that, <coughs> sorry, isn't that just Weber rewritten in a slightly yes. different form? What the, the state is the state, the state, yeah. Yes. So yes. what's Stuart bringing to the table that's different to Weber? He's emphasising, um, he's not talking about 
the state <coughs> sort of a barrier to it, is emphasizing civil society. That's the phrase that gives you civil society. That's the, and he's taking it from, isn't it, traditional value of what's been called produced in civil society. So that's what it's that sort of So there are similarities over that, but they don't emphasize the aspects of it, rather than you're competing for some market environment. So that's the same. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I, that's fascinating. It's, what strikes me is how codified it is and how nuanced it, these rules and kind of regulations are. And so I'm just wondering, um, how do people learn these rules and these codes? I mean, I know you, you've done work on universities yeah. and this Baldy guy is working yeah. in a university. I mean, is this something that people would kind of study at universities? Is this something they would learn from private tutors? Is it something they just pick up from kind of the cultural... It's a good question. Being out in the street. The atmosphere yeah. of being out in the street and seeing a play out. I mean, is there question. literacy issues here? Yeah. Like That's reading literacy, question. cultural literacy? That's a very good question. I mean, as I said, I mean, I wanted to fit... I mean, originally I started with this text. But then it became obvious it was part of this tradition mm -hmm. of the Shields and the And I gave you a whiz through all those titles. Um, Many of those have got multiple editions, which suggests that they are popular and being read. This one, should I tell you this? How many editions of this text? this? About 20. Any about 20? Yes. Do an auction. <laughs> <laughs> You're going the wrong way. One. <laughs> one. So all this time that we have lavished on this text, it's that there's actually only one additional. And I think this fits into this argument I've got that it's from a particular situation that Bologna, okay, it's, it's about Bologna, it's about the Bologna is a little bit about they need to be this sort of thing. So I think this is for the readership there. Um, but other texts in the tradition are reprinted. Um, it's not taught formally, it's not part of anything written. It's just he happens to be a professor. I mean, the other people who write the Shensi Kaffarasi, they are knights, some of them. Others are lawyers. Because they've got to deal with the situation. This isn't going through the courts or any judicial process, but this is the situation that's happening. How can we as lawyers address that? It's just some of the authors are lawyers. So that's sort of the authorship in that. Thank you for your paper. Um, I'm very fascinated by this idea of the code of, of behaviour and how it works hierarchically. Yeah. And of course I'm reminded of modern day bikey gangs in this Hunter region of Newcastle where they will speak of this incredible code, they of, have a how, code. That's very interesting. of how you behave yeah. towards each other and other gangs of yeah. course. And it does lead and how these right. matters are settled. That's true. Have there been studies of this? Sorry? Have there been studies of this? Uh, there's some studies going on. Yeah, really yes. Because clearly <laughs> these situations arise and how do you respond? Yes. And the issues which crop up. And, 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 the, and the issues are usually about somebody has broken the code. Yeah. yeah. And in fact that's how the whole interaction so really takes place, yeah. apart from the economic... Well, why? Yeah. What? So they operate outside of the state. Yes. It's a code that operates outside of the normal... Are they criminal or just... Yes. Fringe Both. Criminal? Well, they, they can be quite powerful in their right. own way. Okay. They can be. A sort of they... outlaw. Yes. yes, yes. That's really interesting. An important code. And also amongst bushrangers in the 19th century. Again, operating outside of the code of the colonial state. Right. No, because the law yes. state isn't reaching that. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. So it's social situations, how you're going to regulate them, you have to have codes. So we should get them, I'll translate them. Yes, I think you're going to do That was very interesting. That was um, really great, actually. Um, was, I mean, I imagine there'd be a lot of regional abuse, you know, nice. and those sorts of things. What about racial abuse in this period? Is there any sort of reference to wars, for example, maybe in southern Italy, or have you come well, across any? Well, 
I've got a case involving, this is Pisa. So Pisa is a port for a galleys. Uh, the Grand Duke has a fleet. Um, criminals, man the galleys, but also you've got Africans. <coughs> and there's a case I've come across against the students at the University of Pisa where they are reprimanded because it's carnival time. And they have antagonised these Moors because they've gone around wearing masks pretending to be Moors. And this has led to a reaction from the Moors. So that's, that's the case I can think of as a sort of racial act. That does happen. Uh, I just um, I just wanted to sort of make a remark that I just found, and it's because of the fact I'm writing one of the, I'm really interested in the private yes, good. thing that's going yeah, on yeah. there. And it's sort of like, I just wondered if you might comment a bit more on it. It seems to me a bit like there's an issue about um, public man versus yeah. private man yeah. there. Right. And what's acceptable. Well, thank you, that's really helpful. Because we hope that one of the, the strands going through you just talk about what happens if you're offended in secret, yeah. or behind your back. Somebody tells you about it. They haven't said it directly to your face, but someone, some kind friend, has told you this. <laughs> what do you do? Do you have to respond? Um, how do you? If it's okay to behave in public differently from how you behave in private, and that's one of his common themes. Mm. So clearly, this is an issue. Um, of, there is a difference perceived between the public and the private. Yeah, is that a new thing for this time period? Do you think? Is this part of a change? It's people are aware of I mean happening this is it's green black to the sort of you know the formation of the self, the presentation mm -hmm. of the self that it's different from this is the only time I would fight with my supervisor. I can remember. Because we were working on Castellani's book of the course. <coughs> and one of his great arguments is about what he calls sprezzatura, which is how the Court, you're supposed to behave, you're supposed to do everything very well, nonchalantly. So it's basically an act, it's not sincere. And my supervisor, who's a gentleman, this is all sincere. And I said, It's not, you know, they want to get jobs as court, it's, it's all fake. And we've got cross with them. But um, there is, it does go back, it is a common thing. <laughs> of, and if you look at Hamlet, you know, what's Hamlet about? People behaving differently in public and private. That's what one of the things that drives them mad. And also to play with them. So it is a common thing. And how do you deal with it? A couple of times there was mention of the religious. Yes. And I'm wondering uh, whether or not that the, the church and its power and influence he was putting himself at risk, suggesting that maybe we should be able to uh, impugn the clergy if necessary. Well, thank you for that. That's another one. Because one of the other chapters, he talks about what happens if you're offended by the, by the religious by the clergy. That story, um, it starts off in a church. And the priest is celebrating the Mass. And there's a gang of youths at the back of the church, jabbering away, making the noise. And this really, you know, the priest is there, the priest is home, blah, blah, blah. and there's a lot of noise coming around the back of the church. Anyway, Mass finishes, the, the priest goes to the vestry, jumps out investment goes after these guys and starts beating them up. <laughs> How dare you mate? <laughs> what do they do? You know, he's their parish priest. You know, he's come after them. How do you respond? Can you respond? So that was the religious example. The other one I think was, was the architect one because some board or more church commissioned a new building and they offended the architect. Can the architect have go back at the clergy because they've got all these legal protections? So, and they also have the problem of insults within the clergy itself, yeah. within the whole hierarchical. Yeah. Between orders and all that. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering, earlier on you said uh, you were talking about sources. Yeah. You were talking about how you really were involved in judicial cases. Yes. Yeah. And now you're moving on to well, this, you know, text, this yeah. wonderful text. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, am I wrong in thinking that this text seems to be um, focused or directed more at, say, the higher social economy? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I would have thought judicial cases would get much more mixed. Exactly. You know, exactly. And that's the great part. So how do you... 
is there some sort of categorization that you make in your minds about you know, what sort of levels you're talking about? I think what I'm trying to do, I'm not disparaging in any way, shape, or form judicial records or judicial records. They are really, really important, and I, I've used them, I will continue to use them. It's just that with this one, I'm trying to look. Now, there are problems. So I like to use them with students, so I use them with you out. Um, some of them have been translated in cases by the colleagues. And I use them as primary sources for the students. I think love them because they get really involved with them. And then almost always you don't know what happens. Because you get to that point of the trial and then it sort of disappears into another court and you don't know what happened to this war. And you don't know because of the nature of the record. So they have limitations. But you're right, you do reach parts of the population that are reaching the source. With this, um, what I think its value is that it's somebody clearly highly intelligent and extremely systematic and long-winded who is standing back and looking systematically at the issue and all the possible permutations. And that's why I think this is a, it's a value. I think they've all got that different value. It should be used. Uh, okay, so you're saying that Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.